Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today we're going to be diving into the claims made by Instagram sensation Glucose Goddess and look at the trend of balancing blood sugar levels to lose weight. And you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my general disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. As always, please feel free to skip this video if it's not supportive to your journey, as we will be discussing weight loss. And if you are not already subscribed here, hit that subscribe button and follow me over on TikTok and Instagram at Abby's Kitchen. All right, so apparently you guys have a lot of questions about this creator. My DMs have been low-key raging with messages about the self-proclaimed glucose goddess, Jessie in Chaspe. And I get it. Jessie's posts and graphics are admittedly really captivating and convincing. Her diet suggestions seem almost magical and surprisingly simple. Things like eating food in a specific order, adding a single ingredient to keep you in fat burning mode, and tweaking your breakfast to kiss your cravings away. Something fishy going on here. And she's clearly made an impact considering she's been on a very successful media tour to promote her best-selling book, Glucose Revolution. But do all of her claims stack up to the science? Well, before we go too far, I want to highlight that blood sugar control is actually very important. This is not something that I'm against or think of as like BS. Metabolic disease is definitely on the rise, and according to the CDC, more than one in three Americans have prediabetes and one in 10 have diabetes. Those are some very significant numbers, so I definitely do support the cause. What I don't like though is the sensationalism and mis representation of science to the point of hysteria, food fear, and obsession. So let me separate nutrition truth from some really f***ing good marketing to sell books. Exhibit A, this statement right here. 80% of non-diabetics are likely to experience glucose spikes with everyday foods like breakfast cereal. I mean, no wonder people are f***ing scared. Even folks who don't really know anything about diabetes probably know that glucose spikes sounds like bad news bears. So now you've got it in your head that even if you're metabolically healthy, you're walking around with like raging blood sugars just from eating normal food. This kind of statement is known as a hook. It draws you in because you now feel like this is personal, like it's about you. However, this very specific claim, which she actually takes the liberty to randomly bump up to 90% in an Instagram post, isn't exactly the whole truth. It comes from a study that she cites, which found that a standardized diet of cornflakes and milk caused glucose elevation in the pre-diabetic range in about 80% of the participants. Now, besides the fact that this study was a small one and not representative of the entire general population, let's pretend for a minute that the statement is true. If this is the case, we now need to ask two important questions. One, do blood sugar spikes really happen in healthy non-diabetic people? And two, are glucose spikes actually a super bad thing? Now to the first point, if you are a healthy person metabolically, your blood sugar levels are controlled by a variety of hormonal feedback mechanisms, mostly involving insulin and glucagon. These little puppies run a very tight ship and prevent your blood sugar levels from rising too quickly or dropping too low. And this is really important because chronically high blood sugar levels are very dangerous for really anyone. But this concept was actually put to the test by the all you can eat pizza study that I spoke to in my insulin video. So it basically showed that even when healthy men ate so much pizza that they thought they were gonna burst, their blood sugar levels never really rose above a certain point. Reiterating that in healthy folks without diabetes, our blood sugar levels are very tightly regulated regardless of how much or what we eat. Now, this study is also not exactly representative and it's obviously an extreme example. I mean, eating as much as you can possibly stuff into your mouth is not exactly best practice. 
But when we look at more moderate studies that look at blood sugar levels in free living people, we see that 96% of the time, blood sugar levels remain between 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. We also see that the median fluctuation between readings, known as glucose variability, is quite low in healthy participants, basically sitting at 18.2% versus 26.1% in people with diabetes. This means that in general, the difference between the highs and the lows in a healthy person is not really all that much, which is another nod to our tight little glucose regulation ship. Tight, 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 tight. So scary blood sugar spikes are actually not that common. And if or when they do happen, our bodies jump in and remedy the situation pretty quick. But let's just say that you did get a spike. How bad would that actually be? Well, our girl glucose goddess tells us that these spikes mutate our DNA, leading to every wellness influencer's favorite frenemy, inflammation, which again is scary as f Thankfully, it's not the whole truth. The research suggests that for folks with diabetes, blood sugar spikes can be more dramatic since the body's regulatory system isn't really working optimally. Now, blood sugar spikes can actually damage blood vessels and increase inflammation through increasing oxidative stress, which is exactly what Jesse says. And this is why folks with diabetes take medication, um, insulin, or follow dietary guidelines to help temper those major spikes. But here's what her statement is missing. People with diabetes. In the non-diabetic population who have healthy working pancreases, not only are we not having these dramatic spikes, but there's really little evidence to show that the small variations that we do have is promoting any chronic inflammation. So to recap, for healthy non-diabetic folks, blood sugar spikes aren't generally a major problem or danger. But does this mean that we don't need to worry about blood sugar control at all? Not so fast. For those of us with healthy blood sugar control mechanisms, there are still some benefits to paying attention to how our food or activity affects our blood sugar levels. Mainly that sustained blood sugar levels can keep you feeling satiated and energized longer, reducing the need for constant snacking and making a calorie deficit and therefore weight loss easier. And this brings me to exhibit B, one of her signature hacks, food eating order. So Jessie basically went viral when a video of her meal order recommendation made its way across Mark Hyman's IG. Basically, Jessie claims that by eating your food in the right order, you can reduce the glucose spike of the meal by 75%. According to her, this means eating your vegetables first, protein and fat second, and starches and sugars last. Now, according to the research on Jesse's website, this hack promotes simple weight loss primarily because it lowers our blood glucose spikes. She then goes on to extrapolate that this will translate into weight loss because lower glucose spikes means lower insulin spikes, and she insists that lowering insulin is the secret to weight loss success. She also quotes one study suggesting that when 16 diabetic patients ate their carbohydrate portion of their meal 10 minutes after they had their protein protein and fat, levels of their hunger hormone ghrelin seem to decline. So let's break all this down. Number one, of all three studies that she quotes, all of them had very small sample sizes, so they're not exactly generalizable. And only one of these studies was conducted using non-diabetic subjects. None of the studies focused on weight loss as a primary outcome. And in fact, one study found that weight loss was actually similar between those with the fixed meal order and those who kind of mixed up their meals. Another study that did focus on weight loss in the pre-diabetic population found that people eating their food in a specific meal order and those who receive health guidance lost a similar amount of weight over a six month period. So this suggests that some guidance may be better than nothing, but not that meal order is directly related or causing the weight loss. Two, if you're a regular stan here, you now know that insulin is not the big bad fat storage hormone that everyone makes it out to be. I did a whole video on why lowering your insulin isn't going to make or break your weight loss, 
a calorie deficit is. If we do see a benefit to a lower insulin life on helping you tip the scales, it's largely because foods that are lower on the glycemic index and therefore elicit a lower insulin spike, like vegetables, tend to keep us feeling fuller longer for fewer calories, which just makes eating less a little easier. You also likely are not eating as often or as much if fasting is part of your insulin lowering plan. Fewer eating episodes, fewer calories in general. And three, while the Graylin study is super interesting, we definitely need more research to clarify if these results can be applied to different populations because there are actually other studies that show that meal order has no real effect on ghrelin levels or perceived fullness levels. Bottom line, if you lose weight by eating your food in a specific order, it's not like your hormones are just like clicking into a magic place and presto changeo, the fat's just gonna melt away. It's, magic. it's just that we know that dietary fat, fiber, and protein, aka the hunger crushing combo, helps to slow down gastric emptying and provide a more sustained glucose response. It also makes you feel fuller for longer, which again, we're back to that whole calorie deficit thing. Interestingly, a year or so ago, I actually DM'd Jessie about this concept and I asked her how deliberate she thought you'd have to be to reap the benefits of this approach. Now, this was before her book came out and she was like hammering home her message with lots of marketing savvy. But she basically told me that if it makes sense in a meal to like have a salad first, for example, then great. But if not, she said you don't need to like super stress over which bite in a mixed meal comes first. And this is precisely my take home message as well. The benefits of dressing up naked carbs for blood sugar control are well documented, but stressing over the first bite in your primavera penne being like a floret of broccoli instead of your chicken or your pasta may actually do more harm than good. We know that our cortisol levels can be heightened in times of stress. So things like strict dieting or following very rigid food rules. And excess cortisol is also not good for our blood sugar control or insulin sensitivity. And since it seems like Jessie herself acknowledged this in her message to me before her book was released, I can't help but wonder if this hack has been overhyped. And that brings me to exhibit C, her secret ingredient to fat loss. Now, according to Jessie, we can eat dessert without getting kicked out of fat burning mode simply by adding a standard pantry staple, vinegar. Now, if we ignore the fact that this verbiage is problematic from a relationship with food stance, does vinegar really put you in or keep you in a fat burning zone? Danger zone! Well, Jessie's evidence of this is grounded in some legitimate science. So vinegar does seem to have a blood glucose lowering effect, possibly because it's thought to delay gastric emptying. Now it then follows the thinking that we already unpacked that if your blood sugar is controlled, your insulin is lowered and you can miraculously lose weight. As is often the case with a lot of like diet experts, this all seems to have originated from a shred of science that gets stretched Mm, a little thin. The research we have on the benefits of vinegar for insulin and glucose suppression shows that although using vinegar does seem to have a beneficial effect on blood glucose levels in the short term, i.e. day to day, over the long term, that is like chronic use over a month or more, the research is more sparse on the effects in a healthy population. Where we do see some long-term benefits, however, is in patients with glucose abnormalities like diabetes and PCOS, possibly through an effect on insulin sensitivity. And you also have to take quite a lot of it, like up to two tablespoons before meals. Unless you don't mind carrying around a handbag with like a bottle of vinegar in it at all times, this feels somewhat impractical. Regularly drinking vinegar can also result in side effects like tooth enamel erosion and worsening of existing gastritis. Now, thankfully, Jesse does recommend that you dilute the vinegar with water and drink it through a straw to reduce the effects. But I do feel like this kind of just like adds to its impracticality. Honestly, I'm not convinced that the inconvenience is worth it for folks with normally functioning pancreases. Nor do I think it's accurate to say that a shot of vinegar is going to magically keep you in fat burning zone while you eat dessert. And finally, let's talk about her hot take on breakfast. So a final take home tip that we see peppered throughout Jessie's online content and book is that a simple small change to your morning breakfast will unlock your energy and decrease your cravings. 
That is, just swap your sweet breakfast for something savory. I think the point of this tip is to like cutely say that we should try not to have donuts, danishes, and frappuccinos for breakfast. And yeah, like that makes sense. Those foods are all rich in simple carbs and low in the fiber, protein, and fat that we just established helps to keep us full and energized for longer. And even though a healthy individual's blood glucose levels are tightly controlled to prevent legitimate dangerous highs and lows, research suggests that minor fluctuations can still make us feel a bit blah. So what she could have said was, a Krispy Kreme for breakfast isn't great for your blood sugars, but that doesn't sound like a sexy soundbite. And you know what? We do need to sometimes simplify nutrition. It's complicated as but not when the context that we lose helps to make good nutrition more attainable in real life. Folks, a healthy diet for blood sugar management is not about the flavor or taste of your food. It's not even about a single food. It's about the nutritional content of a complete meal or many meals over time. And to call out all sweet foods as being bad for your blood sugars means eliminating a lot of super nutritious staples that we really love. Think about things like oatmeal with berries and nut butter, Greek yogurt with peaches and almonds, or a smoothie with protein powder, fruit, nuts, and milk. For a lot of us, breakfast just is not breakfast if it's not sweet. So being relegated to eggs and avocado might not be such a small change for a lot of people. And even if we were able to cut out all of our favorite sweet breakfast options, making them savory doesn't automatically result in a healthier morning meal. I can think of lots of unbalanced savory breakfasts like white bagels, toast, English muffins, or breakfast hash browns, none of which are going to do our blood sugars any major favors. So while I appreciate that this might be an easy to remember kind of like rule of thumb, I think we can all agree that again, it's not the magic bullet to weight loss or good health. So in conclusion, I don't think that glucose goddess is blatantly wrong about anything here. I just think that she's found a hook that seems to captivate people's attention and gotten a little too aggressive on the marketing. She's turned a small bit of science, particularly in a specific population, into sensationalism and in some cases fear mongering, and I strongly just do not believe that it serves the public well. The real key to blood sugar management and by extension weight loss isn't a big secret that's being gatekept by a biochemist turned born communicator as she's been described. You don't need to obsess over eating a piece of broccoli before a piece of pasta or carting a bottle of vinegar around in your purse or swearing off oatmeal just because it's sweet. It simply comes down to nutrition 101. Moderation, balance, variety. It's a super unsexy approach that, let's be real, doesn't sell out diet books, but honestly, it actually does work. So if you are truly struggling with your blood sugar control, please speak to a registered dietitian and a doctor about your unique healthcare needs. Chances are you can still have a sweet breakfast if that's your thing. And on that note, that's all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on what you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.